Uh, Richard, you have shared the 2017 Chemistry Nobel Prize with Jacques de Boucher and Joachim Frank for the development of the cryo methodology for the determination of the structure of biomolecules with atomic resolution. Can you briefly explain what is structural biology? So structural biology started about 1926 or 1927 when there were scientists here in Cambridge in the physics department. So uh, William Asprey and J.D. Bernal were young scientists then and they decided to begin by shining X-ray uh, beams at biological structures, either um, uh, crystals of biological molecules or fibrous structures. And they sort of kicked it off and that's, it's believed that's how structural biology started. And it was defined then as, and then it has grown of course, to be the, um, the study of the structure of all the molecules in biology using various methods, initially X-ray crystallography, but then other methods like electron microscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy have come in. So these technical methods are used to dissect and analyze the structures so that you can then understand uh, what it is that makes the uh, whole of biology tick because of the molecules that are underlying all the processes. So that's the core of structural biology. The first time structural biology was used as a term was about 1960. Don Casper created a department and he put structural biology on the door. But now we all say we are structural biologists because it's been a very successful method. There's now hundreds of thousands of structures and uh, thousands of people doing structural biology. What is cryo-EM in a nutshell? So of the three methods that are the principal methods in structural biology, electron microscopy itself started about 1930 when it was realized you could focus electrons and make images just like you do with light that you focus with a lens. So the first lenses were developed in the, in the 1930s and then uh, the difficulty with electron microscopy, electrons only pass through a vacuum. If you have them in air, they scatter and then you can't uh, image them. They get, uh, they, they, they get scattered and then it would be very blurry. In the early stages of electron microscopy, people could only look at um, structures that had heavy metal stains on them. So, so uranium, platinum, things like that. And so the early progress of electron microscopy was all in material science and so on. It wasn't till later that people started looking at biological structures. And the problem with biological structures, they are made up of organic molecules, so carbonaceous material. You put the beam of electrons on them, they get damaged, bonds break, they get ionized. So you get radiation damage and they fall apart. So all the early work in, in structural biology was done with um, either uh, metal, shadowing or negative stain, but it was realized that if you could freeze the specimens down to a very low temperature so that the atoms wouldn't move, the structures would be preserved. Uh, so you can, you can freeze structures and then you can thaw them out and there are still a, the enzymes are alive, cells are still alive. The development of electron cryomicroscopy didn't start till about 1980 when it was methods were developed by Jacques Dubochet, the person who shared the 2017 Chemistry Nobel Prize. They developed ways of, of freezing them. And so what you do then is you make a thin film of your biological molecules embedded in amorphous ice, and then you put the electron beam through it, collect it with a lens and make images. So you're just, you're just magnifying images of the biological molecules without any uh, uh, use of metal stains. You're looking at the molecules, the atoms, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, the molecules that make up, the atoms that make up the biological uh, molecules, and then you get an image, just like if you take a photograph of us uh, with light, you take a photograph of the molecules with electrons, and then you can see them. They've just been magnified a million times. Now there's 10 microscopes so we have to find one.
Here we have a 20-year-old electron microscope. Uh, it can do either normal specimens or we can put into here uh, a cold stage and do uh, electron cryomicroscopy. At the very top of the microscope, there is a field emission electron gun source. Uh, then there are a couple of lenses that illuminate the specimen to the level here. And then at this level and below, there are three or four more lenses that magnify the image of the specimen. You can look down the binoculars and you can see it on the screen. At the moment, there's, no, there's not a specimen in there, so that's just a homogeneous beam. Or you can lift the screen like this, and then the beam goes down onto this electronic detector. And then that you would see on the, on the TV screen here. And then it would be recorded onto disk, just like a digital camera and then go into the computer and be processed to give you the, the image that we all want to get. An, an outsider to the field would normally ask, are you doing SEM or TEM? So yes. why do you call it cryo-EM instead of cryo-TEM? So electron microscopy originally, it wasn't clear what the best way of using the electrons to make the images to see what you're interested in uh, better than you can see with light. Um, so the, the difference between what they call transmission electron microscopy, TEM, and scanning electron microscopy, uh, SEM, uh, is that uh, in transmission electron microscopy, the electrons go all the way through the sample, they get scattered, and then you image uh, and, and the molecules also, they don't absorb the electrons, they only scatter them. It alters the phases of the electron waves. And so you're, you're imaging essentially by looking through a transparent uh, object. The, the biological molecules are transparent, but you get the uh, modulation of the electron beam, the phase contrast. Whereas scanning electron microscopy, you put the electrons on the specimen and you look at the ones that are backscattered. So you can look at a solid object. Uh, so one of them is transmitted and the other one is reflected. And the different characteristics of SEM and TM mean that SEM is good for sort of big objects. You don't get very high resolution. You have to cover it usually with metal. So in structural biology, uh, SEM is used as a sort of diagnostic tool, but it's not very powerful. Transmission electron microscopy, you can go in principle to one very, very high resolution, get very detailed pictures of all the atoms. And so in our field, uh, basically SEM doesn't, is not a strong candidate, it doesn't really exist. And so we just say we are electron microscopists, or better, we like to call ourselves structural biologists, because then that doesn't mean that you have to say, I am doing X-ray crystallography. So now uh, most structural biologists, they they can go back and forward between all the different methods. One big debate is whether we should, when we have the specimen cold, liquid nitrogen temperature, should we call it electron cryo microscopy, or some people say cryo electron microscopy. You're just saying it's cold, but it's the specimen that's cold. The electrons are actually hot. They come out at 2000 degrees. So we prefer electron cryo microscopy, or, but cryo EM is okay. You have been working at the LMB since the 70s. Can you tell us what makes this place unique? When I was um, an undergraduate, I was in Edinburgh doing physics. And I looked into where physics was going. And I thought, actually, from all of the different types of physics, particle physics, solid state physics, you know, fusion research to produce unlimited power and so on, um, I, I thought biophysics might be something that you wouldn't need a team of a thousand people. You know, the gravitational wave discoveries recently, they needed a thousand people, you know, all over the world. It costs thousands of millions. But in biophysics, you can do work uh, with yourself or one or two people and so on. So I thought that was a good idea. So I looked around in the UK. I didn't want to go abroad and hadn't quite decided, but I went to talk to the physics professor in Edinburgh, who was called Bill Cochran. And he said, oh, he said, uh, I, don't, I don't think you should go to Norwich or London or Oxford. He said, you should write to Max Perutz, who was the first director of the MRC Laboratory of Electromagnetic. And when I came here, it was in 1966, and it, it was on a Saturday, 
and everyone is working. I thought, this is, this is marvelous. So I said, okay, I'd like to come as a student. I came, and then I went away for, as a postdoc, came back in 1973, and I keep looking around for good labs, but I still haven't found a better one. And so it's grown also. It's grown from, there were about 70 or 80 people in 1966. It had started, it had been founded in 1960 by the merger of the biophysics group from the Cavendish, which was Francis Crick, uh, John Kendrew, Max Perutz, and so on, and the more biochemically oriented group from the biochemistry branch, which was Fred Sanger, uh, Brian Hartley, Jan Harris, and so on. So there was a merger of two groups from two different uh, Cambridge University departments who, who didn't like the molecular biologists. They wanted them to go. So they said, please leave. And so they got money from the MRC, built a new building, and then they recruited people also from London, Aaron Klug, uh, Hugh Huxley came from London. And so it was um, a new lab created from uh, people who had a, a clear research plan, a clear vision. And so it was a very good lab in the 60s. And many people predicted it would just die out because as the second generation, obviously the first generation are, are great. And they had uh, six months after the lab opened, they had four Nobel Prize winners that um, 1962, but the, the critics said the second generation, they will be less uh, talented scientists than the founders, and then the third generation will be even worse, and then eventually it will just disappear. But actually the opposite has happened. What has happened is the founders attracted good people, and it's continued to, so now it went from sort of 70 or 80 people, it's now up to five or 600 or something like that, and it's really quite productive, and we, we really get or the lab really gets very good students, postdocs, and young group leaders now. And it's not necessarily because they're recruited, it's because they, they have noticed the lab, they've identified it, and they think, well, you know, this would be a good place for them to work, just like I. So it's now uh, that's 53 years for me, to me. So. But I, I'm kind of trying to retire now. So the younger ones are obviously working harder, and they're full of good ideas. So there's still... Uh, a long way to go in terms of, um, it's a medical research council lab, so we're supposed to have our eye on medical research, but often really important revolutionary treatments for, you know, uh, say human welfare or in agriculture and so on. They often come not because you're working on liver cancer or something like that, you're working on uh, some basic biology and you don't realize that it will have an impact on a much wider area. So I think a lot of the work uh, in the lab is, is uh, basic biology uh, that develops completely unknown ideas that, that do revolutionary improvements in um, health and wealth rather than evolutionary improvements. And so that still seems to be happening. Such fun, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you can go into... Action? Action, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah, so just don't lean back like all the way. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sorry. If we get trained enough, we can, be we can become film stars. <laughs> <laughs>